Thank you. I have a little video to show you, and I want you to watch it gently and try and uh, try and follow the instructions. If you've already seen this, don't uh, don't yell things out or whatever you might be tempted to do. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? between sensation and perception. The light is obviously coming into your eyes from the screen with the moonwalking bear on it, but you don't perceive it. We have, all humans have what's called selective attention, where we pick out certain things that are important and focus on them, and the other stuff you don't notice. You've probably been sitting at the lunch table talking to your buddy, and all of a sudden you hear your name said at another table. And you're like, hey, what's going on over there? You were actually hearing everything that was going on on the other table, but you weren't perceiving it. And when they said your name, you perceived that. Because there's a part of your brain that's subconsciously listening to everything, and it calls it to your awareness only when it's important. If the breakdancing bear had come by wearing red, Part of your brain would have seen that and brought it to your attention, then you would have focused on it. But he was wearing black like the other players, and you were not focusing on the people wearing black. Isn't that interesting? There is a whole <laughs> thing going on below your conscious awareness that you, you sense, but you don't perceive. So there's a difference. Sensation is the detection of physical energy emitted or reflected by physical objects. It occurs when energy in the external environment or the body stimulates receptors in the sense organs. Sensation is driven by your nervous system. You sense things through your nervous system. Do you all know the senses? Uh, sight, 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 smell, touch, smell, touch hearing, hearing, and taste. And taste. taste. You know, a lot of scientists throw balance in, too. You have a sense of, a sense of balance. So so you have all, and, and uh, another sense would, might be pain, which is a little bit different. Um, all of this comes in through your nervous system and is processed in the brain. But then the brain does something with the information, which uh, we call perception. The process by which the brain organizes and interprets the sensory information. So your brain says, okay, here's some information, but it's not important. <laughs> like, for, for instance, right now, your brain is probably sensing the feel of your clothes <coughs> against your skin. But you're not perceiving it unless you think about it. Then if you think about it, you can say, oh, yeah, I can feel the clothes kind of touching my skin. Or maybe the sense of what temperature it is or something like that. Um, there are things that are sensed but not perceived. So your brain says, okay, this stuff is not important. We won't worry about that. We'll spend our information worrying about what Mr. Willis is talking about, hopefully. But some of you not. You're focused on, I don't know, something on the floor. 
you know, your phone, cell phone, good. Look at this ambiguous figure, figure, figure. Let's call it an ambiguous figure. Can you see which side is the colored surface? Is it the front side or the back side? There's two ways of looking at that where you could see it as the front or see it as the back. Can y'all uh, can y'all see that? Mm -hmm. It's interesting that there's no way to see them both at the same time. You either see one or the other. You can change the way you look at it to see either. Is it more common to see it one way or another? That sounds like a psychology project. I don't know. I see the, the colored as the front side. How many see it as the front side? Just when you first look at it. How many see it as the back side? How many don't see it? <coughs> you should always ask when you're asking a series of questions like that, ask a question that doesn't make sense to see if people are even paying attention to the question. Some people just don't listen and just raise their hand. That's something you learn when you're learning experimental design. If you're going to be a scientist, you'll probably take a class on experimental design. And learn. If you saw the color side and the back side, though, you'd be looking at it from, from like a downwards angle from the top of the box. Yeah. It's more natural to be looking down at a box, so that's probably why you see the, the color side as the front. That's a good point. And we'll see some uh, some uh, uh, optical illusions that where past experience causes you to see things a different way. Good point. Yeah. No, no. yeah, you normally you look at a box, you're looking down on it, so maybe that's why most of us see the. Wouldn't only the front be the tinted side because no other side's fully filled up? The other sides were actually tinted. They would be completely filled up on there. They could be made of glass. I, I don't know how to explain that. Filled up? I don't know how to explain that. Uh, what if you can make yourself see a 2D figure? See a 2D figure? I mean, like, you won't see a box, you just see a bunch of lines. Yeah, if you've never experienced 3D, you probably <laughs> just see a bunch of lines, yeah. your brain learns how to look at things over time and so we tend to our perception is often different from our from the actual sensation the actual sensation is a 2d figure but we turn it into a perception of 3d it's not really 3d is it it's not a, an actual box it just kind of looks like one um Okay, the, uh, we've talked about the nervous system once, and it has a variety of sense receptors for the different senses, and we're going to spend time looking at how each sense works. And then we're going to look at um, how then the, the psychology uh, of the brain changes the senses a little bit for our perception. The doctrine of specific nerve energies. Different sensory modalities exist because signals received by the sense organs stimulate different nerve pathways leading to different areas of the brain. So the doctrine of specific nerve energy says that, uh, that sight has a whole different pathway to a different part of the brain and that part senses sight. And hearing has another pathway to another part of the brain, and that part stimulates hearing. It is true that people sometimes have those, due to an accident, due to mutation, they have those pathways crossed up. So when you clap, most of us hear a sound. Some people hear the sound and see a flash of light because they've got those nerve pathways crossed up. Isn't that interesting? Wait, why do people that, that that light go from their mind hear things better? Well, uh, there's some. The brain has some what's called plasticity, 
means it can change a little bit. So a big part of your brain not being used will change a little bit to help out the other senses. So you can make some, uh, you know, make some, some idea of what your surroundings are like. Your brain does its best to figure out what the surroundings are like, and if it can't do it by sight, your hearing and your touch and your smell will all pick up. And uh, so the brain kind of can rewire itself so you can be a little better at figuring out what's going on. Yeah. Okay, so you said some people can, we'll see a flash of light when you clap. Mm hmm They have what's called synesthesia. Is that like a hallucination or, or, or what? No, oh, it's, it's real. What happens is they, they have their brain is wired differently, probably due to some mutation or something, where some of the nerves that come from the ear don't all go to the part of the brain for hearing. Some of the nerves go to the part of the brain for sight. They actually see sound. They can see sound? They can see sound. So I'd be talking and, and the sound, and, and as I'm talking, maybe a low voice, the, just for example, I don't know what it is for each particular person, it's probably different. But maybe a low sound, you kind of see a little, it's a, maybe it gets a little darker. And then a high sound, it gets a little lighter, maybe, for you. Something like that. I don't know. It's, it's wired. Most of these synesthesia, and I'll show you a little video on them, these synesthetes, every one of them is a little bit different. Like some, <coughs> some of them might, you clap and they see a flash of light. Or um, some people might hear something that they see. So a lot of really bright light, they hear a sound, you know? Like, would, so like, if they saw the flash of light, would, there, would everything else respond as if they, as if light was really there, there like, the people would constrict or something like that? Um, probably not, because it's happening in your brain. Okay. The pupil reacts to the actual light Physical. before it hits the brain. So the brain uh, doesn't necessarily... Really? Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Have they described any of it to you? Yeah, they can like mostly they hear squares. Like, like. They can hear squares? What do the squares sound like? I don't know. So if they see a square, they hear something? No, it's like they hear it, and then, I don't know. Do the squares talk to them? Do the squares talk to them? Okay, we have, we have some terms you need to know. The absolute threshold is the smallest quantity of physical energy that can be reliable detected, reliably detected by an observer. For instance, the absolute threshold of sound is hearing a pen drop in a quiet room at 20 feet, something like that. That's a little test. Any less sound than that, you can't hear it. The actual absolute threshold of taste is a milliliter of, or, or a cubic centimeter of sugar dissolved in three gallons of water, something like that. Any less sugar than that, you can't taste it. Absolute thresholds are the smallest amount of energy that you can perceive. The difference threshold is the smallest difference in stimulation that can be reliably detected by an observer when two stimuli are compared. <coughs> it's also called the just noticeable difference. Let me give you an example. Listen to these two sounds. Uh, uh, could you notice the difference? Uh -huh. Well, then the difference between those two sounds was more than the just noticeable difference. There can be a difference between two sounds that's so close that you don't notice it. Then that, those two, then the difference between those two sounds is less than the difference threshold. It's less than the just noticeable difference. I, I got a psychology minor and in college, me and my group had to design a, an experiment to test the just noticeable difference for movement, for speed. And what we did was we got a computer, and my buddy uh, uh, that was in my group, he knew how to program computers, and we had a ball going across the screen like this. 
and we would have the people hit a key, we'd have one going across, and then right after it, another one going across. And they hit a button if they thought that the two went at the same speed. And they hit another button if they thought they were going at different speeds. And so we calculated how different the speeds of the two balls had to be going before you could notice a difference. And we got a value and presented it, and that was our project. We had students coming in. Uh, we got about 20 different students and, and have made a measurement. And some of them, some of, some people could tell better the difference between two than others. As a control, we'd often have two going by that were the same speed, just to make sure, you know. Isn't that interesting? Uh -huh. We got a good grade on that project. Here are the absolute thresholds for, for vision. A candle flame from 30 miles on a dark, clear night. It's pretty good. You go on a mountain over there, 30 miles away, you light a candle, that's about as good as anyone can see. The tick of a watch from 20 feet in total quiet. From uh, me to McLean's about 20 feet. If I had a ticking watch, you could barely hear it. If it was a completely quiet room, there's still noise in this room. The sound of that projector, you gotta get rid of all sound. They don't have ticking watches much anymore, so this needs to be redone. <coughs> Maybe you can come up with something. Smell, a drop of perfume in a three-room three apartment. You're barely able to smell that. The wing of a bee on your cheek dropped from one centimeter. You can barely feel that. One teaspoon of sugar and two gallons of water. You can barely taste that. Are these interesting? Absolute threshold of your senses. I don't know what this is. Apparently they're touching the, somebody's foot, sensing if they can, telling if they can feel it. I don't know, you barely touch you it, you can feel it. With the sock and like you can feel it with the sock on. You can feel it better with the sock on? I should have something explaining that. Sorry. You think your eyes can see so much, but really, your eyes are only tuned in to a tiny bit of the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum is waves of energy that are moving through the air right now. We can see the visible spectrum. We can see electromagnetic waves that are between 400 and 700 nanometers of wavelength. A nanometer is 10 to the negative ninth meters, which is a billionth of a meter, very, very small. Take a meter, divide it into a billion pieces, and you got a nanometer. That's how big the waves are that we can see, between 400 and 700 nanometers which are pretty small waves. We can't see waves that are longer than that. We call those infrared waves, and those cause heat. Or microwaves, those will vibrate water molecules and cook your food. Or TV signals or radio signals. Those are longer wavelengths. Shorter wavelengths, ultraviolet rays, that gives you sunburn. X-rays, they use them to look at bones. Gamma and cosmic rays are out and floating around in space. A nuclear bomb emits gamma rays. Um, we can't see any of this stuff except for the visible spectrum. Interesting that insects can see a lot of the UV. Snakes can see a lot of the infrared. And thus they can hunt at night and follow the heat pattern of something and get it. Isn't that cool? One reason why our eyes are so tuned into the visible spectrum is that there's a lot of visible light present in our atmosphere. Infrared doesn't move that well through the atmosphere, and, and uh, radio waves do, but they can't carry as much information as visible light can. 
And these things up here move very poorly through the atmosphere. So that's probably why we're so well tuned in to the visible spectrum. It's an evolutionary thing. Signal detection theory. Responses in a detection task depend upon a sensory process and a decision process. These may vary with a person's motivation, alertness, and expectations. So if you give a detection task, if you say, hit a button whenever you hear the tone, have you all ever had your hearing checked? Anyone here had their hearing checked? You have to hit a button when you hear a tone? Or tell, tell the doctor when you hear a tone? Is that how it works? I haven't had one in a long time. I think it's if it, if it changes, I think. What's that? Isn't it if it changes? If it changes, you, you tell them? I thought that's what it was. Okay. So, this is a task that differs between people. It differs based on, it can differ based on how alert you are, how awake you are. If you stayed up studying all night the night before, you may be a lot poorer at sensing hearing and hearing changes than if you didn't. So... Motivation, alertness, expect if you're motivated to hear something, you'll hear it better. If I say I'm going to give you a thousand dollars if you if you can tell me when you hear that sound, you'll hear it better than if I don't do that. Isn't that interesting? Focus is very important. you be, yeah, I hear it. No, I didn't play anything. Now we all have sensory adaptation. That's when you get used to something and you no longer sense it anymore. For instance, you jump in a cold pool, after a few minutes you don't notice the cold anymore. You walk into a room that smells real bad, you go, ah, oh, it smells terrible. After a few minutes you don't notice anymore. We call that sensory adaptation. You can get used to something. And you can get used to almost anything, even, even light. Light is harder to adapt to. But if there's a constant light that's bothersome, you'll slowly adapt to it. Can dogs, some dogs have like a slower, I have a harder time adapting to a smell because Because they have a much better sense of smell, that's correct. Well, I thought it was because their nose is constantly like wet. Like there's something that keeps it. Uh, yeah, our nose is constantly wet on the inside. Um, but yeah, they have to, uh, you know, the uh, smell particles have to dissolve in water to be sensed. So, so that's why they have a better sense of smell. Well, that happens with us too, but they have 50 times the, s the s smell receptors that humans have. Because their nose is a lot longer, they have a lot more smell receptors. This is a sensory deprivation tank. And uh, people pay big money to, people with a lot of money pay money to go lay in these things. What it is, it's a tank where the water is made such a temperature that you can't feel it. And it has salts in it so that you float so you're not touching anything. And when they close it up, they turn it on all the lights so you can't see anything. And it's got soundproof walls so you can't hear anything. And so basically, and there's no smell in there, you can't smell anything, so basically all your senses are completely deprived. And you go lay in this thing, it's supposed to be very relaxing. I've never done it. They show a sensory deprivation tank on page 180. A lady laying in it, kind of like this. Doesn't have that picture. Doesn't that look like fun? I wouldn't be able to do that. So you go in there and you just kind of lay there and kind of people who have very stressful lives um, like to do that sort of thing. It's supposed to be therapeutic. Check it out, page 179. I want you to do this little exercise. This shows that the sense of vision can actually adapt. Sensation depends on change and contrast in the environment. Hold your hand over one eye and stare at the dot in the middle of the circle on the right. You should have no trouble maintaining an image of a circle, page 179. 
However, if you do the same with the circle on the left, the image will fade. The gradual change from light to dark does not provide enough contrast to keep your visual receptors firing at a steady rate. The circle reappears only if you close and reopen your eye or shift your gaze to the X. You're actually getting used to the light change. How freaking cool is that? Huh? Sensory adaptation. If you close one eye for longer, mm -hmm. for like a long period of time, you open you? it and you close the one that you kept open, don't you see a lot more light? I don't know. It does seem like it's brighter. Page 176, did y'all look at this? See the puzzle pieces? How many see the puzzle pieces? Oh, they put puzzle pieces there. Can you see the word tie? see the word tie right away because when, whenever you see pictures like that in the past you're used to focusing on the shapes not focusing on the space between the shapes so you tend to see puzzle pieces and not the word tie there's a flower as we see it and there's a flower as an insect sees it different they're attracted to the pollen you can see there's pollen scattered around on the petals of the flower that you can only see in ultraviolet. Isn't that cool? The world is more than we actually know it is. All right, I have an interesting little video here for you on synesthesis. You want me to turn this off? Yeah, you can turn that off.